From Grooveview Studios in Columbus, Ohio, this is Getting the Brand Back Together, a podcast exploring the interdisciplinary art of banding, branding, and business building. Rock and roll relic, poet, writer, and brandist, I'm your host, Brad Sertoni. Today, we're joined by Maureen Metcalf, the founder and CEO of Innovative Leadership Institute. Welcome to the podcast, Maureen. Brad, it is a delight to get to hang out with you again. And you call yourself a relic. You are the innovative dude. You have reinvented yourself <laughs> more than once. I took a few things from Madonna. It's in the <laughs> Italian blood. What I wanted to talk with you about today, because of your specific uh, expertise, and I love the adjective innovative leadership. I, I think that for what you do and the way you do it, there's nobody better. And I am sensitive to this idea of innovative leaders because we're trying to build brands that matter. And that's hard to do, as you know, Maureen, if the uh, leader isn't innovative or worse yet, pretend to be to the culture within. So, I thought today it would be interesting to think about what I'm calling the good leaders, the great leaders, those who, uh, to to borrow uh, our term, we call them brandists. They're they're doing the goodwill of the brand. They're they're practicing the pillars of the brand, everything from philosophy to culture to values to programmatic details of what the innovative future may look like. And then… There might be those leaders who haven't matured and either directly or indirectly, they are what we term bandits in that they are in some way, again, directly or indirectly, malevolently or not so, but they are stealing equities of the brand for perhaps short-term scopes, uh, pressure from um, boards and leadership teams, uh, or just to make those quarterly numbers. And I thought nobody better to talk about this balancing act between building brands and building great leaders that can be mature and innovative um, without being bandits. So first, if you could talk to me a little bit about this idea of maturity in leadership and what that means, especially in an innovative leader. So we selected the terminology innovative leader because often leaders innovate everything around them. So if they work in a tech firm or they lead a tech firm, they're innovating the technology. If they're physicians, they're innovating the processes to deliver healthcare, um, laser surgery, any range of, of technology to deal with the latest diseases. Often, even though their title is leader, what they're innovating is the stuff, not themselves. And if, my, if I am paid to lead, I spend more than half of my time often leading yes. and some other portion doing the other work. And yet many leaders, if not most leaders, are innovating the external stuff, not who they are mm. and how they function. And I would say it is a both who am I as the person delivering the leading? Okay. And what are the processes I use to deliver my service? And then there is the functional area in which I lead. All of those need to be developed and refined. Wow. So you're taking innovative leadership then is, it's a two-part pie, right? What they're doing programmatically for whoever they're serving and how they're leading themselves. Right. So we all know of people in the press, and depending on which side of the political spectrum you're on, you have one or the other. Examples of a person <laughs> you <laughs> would follow and a person you wouldn't. Yeah. A- and on either side, there are very few people who think they're both good. Right. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. so if great you, analogy, by the way, that hit home. So if you think this way of being is good, yeah. then half of the people who work for you are misaligned. If you think the other way of leading is good, half the people who work for you are misaligned. Now, you've already created a small paradox that you say probably exists in every organization. Let's say you have a small staff of 50 or you have a large staff of, you know, 50,000. Out of the gate, as a leader, you have to accept that half of those may be misaligned. 
and there's some research and I'm not going to be able to call it to memory, but it's something like 70% of people won't follow a leader who has different political views. Really? It's a really big reason not to talk politics at work. Right. So out of the gate, even the most effective leader is going to have a percentage of their population who is so misaligned that whatever they do is perceived by part of their population as not right. Okay, so should a leader, and we'll get into this, this idea of brandist and versus bandit, or is a leader, Maureen, affected then, if, say they're launching a new product line. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's say the brand is sustainable, to use your word, and stable. Uh, and he knows that he's got um, some piracy going on culturally, internally. But he has to make numbers and he has to build a brand and a product line. Does he ignore that other half that isn't following and go down that road to build what he needs to to hit his metric and come back and, and to come back and save them according to his leadership? Or does he get them aligned? I think you have to get them aligned. Now, I, I also acknowledge that everyone's not going to be aligned. And then you make decisions good enough. Okay. Right? I, I have one of my key people who is very different than me. Uh-huh. And we're able to work together what I think is incredibly effectively. Okay. So we have very similar values around what we deliver to the clients. Sure. How we work together, how we support one another. On the personal side, we've got some differences. Okay. And we are both okay with those differences. And they're some pretty strong guardrails. Right, right. And if either one of us crosses those guardrails, the other one is a pretty quickly clear about the implications. Okay. So I think there are ways, and I facilitate this often, that there are structured processes where we develop agreements about how we make decisions, how we communicate, how we hold one another accountable. And even though it's my company, she still has to hold me accountable to do what I've committed so that yep. she can do what she's committed. Yes, yes. It's, so, still, it's still an equitable partnership, however you look at it. Mm-hmm. I guess the other thing I'd like you to clear up before we dive in here is when you talk about someone being a mature, innovative leader, by maturity, you don't mean age. I do not mean age. You mean? So there's a field of study called developmental maturity, a lot of different lineage. I happen to follow the research of Bob Keegan, Suzanne Cook-Greuter out of Harvard, uh, Bill Torbert out of Boston College. Uh, Terry O'Fallon is doing some work on the West Coast. One of the reasons I mentioned the lineage is it's well-researched. It's not something you and I made up over drinks. Right. You know, just like childhood development, you know what to expect at the terrible twos. You know what to expect at whatever age. Mm-hmm. Adults develop through a trajectory. And hmm. we know that at a certain stage, they are significantly more effective. And the, the researchers look at cognitive complexity and that at each level of maturity, my thinking becomes more complex, less rule-oriented, more nuanced. Really? More agile? Longer time horizon. So if Don't I'm, be so reactive. Well, you've got to be proactive right. and you've got to have the capacity to react to what comes your way. Right. So so that's the cognitive piece. Okay. Affect is emotional. Okay. Do I know and manage myself? Do I know and manage relationships? There is behavioral. How do I show up? Who do I show up as? You know, things like... I see, that to me is a big part of brand. The, for a CEO, both personally and professionally, right? How they show up. There is the organization's brand and there is the, the leader's CEO's brand. brand. Right. And you hope they're aligned. They're not always, are they? <laughs> well, and and you talk about the idea that the company and the CEO have to be different entities, mm-hmm. right? That my brand as Maureen Metcalf is slightly different than it the is. Innovative Leadership Institute. Yeah. And there may be things where it's very similar and there may be things where it's not similar at all and you don't want it to be. Correct. Yeah. It, so the leader needs to know what that is and what's company compliant, brand compliant, and what's so I have my own MaureenMetcalf.com. What I do mm-hmm. there mm-hmm. could be a little different than what yeah. I do for ILI. Yeah, that's great. So so the point is that at the earlier stages... Of development. Of, of development maturity. and maturity. Yeah. Um, we are black and white, right and wrong, good and bad, short time horizon. We think tasks 
50% of U.S. managers, depending on which research you use, yeah. are that and below. What? 50%. Yeah. The next 35% is the achiever level. They're focused on results. Those are the one and big ego. Uh, okay, but that, and, that's 85% now. Yeah. And we still haven't gotten to the goal. Right. And, and therein lies the problem. That okay, our wait, society, I want you to say those two things again. 50% of our stage developers and maturity are? Experts or diplomats. Mm -hmm. so, so the earlier levels. Right, right. So those are primarily reactive. Yeah. Shorter term high, time horizon. Right. And, and when you listen to the political speech writers. Yeah. Um, that's who they're playing to. That's because that's 50% of the it. base. I got it. A lot of the speech writing, and I'm not talking about the man, I'm talking about the speech writing. I totally understand. Black and white, good yeah. and bad. Yeah. We won if you're not for us, you're you ag lose. against us. Right. Uh, Ronald Reagan, same, same languaging. Yeah. So again, more than half the population. Okay. So, so we start to see the problem. The next level the is- The 35%. Um, our- Achievers focused on results. These are the ones mainly running large companies. companies. And these are the ones who can build brands, but they can also destroy brands. Yes. Why? Because they're focused on short term results. Because that's and just what they're the data incentivized. Now, just that's yeah. how they're all incentivized. And but what's blowing me away about this conversation already is you've just done 85% of the population who's making decisions about business, leadership, and branding is in our worlds below the bar. It's on the wrong side of the bar. Yes. Okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just so we're clear, there's only 15% left. I hope it gets better. It gets better. <laughs> okay. It gets better. All right. But it's also hard. Yes, yeah. I understand. So the next level- That's why you're calling it development maturity. Yes. It's a nice way of saying it. It's a very nice way of saying it. And, and the, the language I'm using for the levels is in the HBR article by Bill Torbert and Associates. Okay. Uh, the seven levels of transformation. Beautiful. Each of the researchers use a different terminology. Sure. And so I want to acknowledge well, that. Because they want to make it proprietary branding. I get it. <laughs> well, and they're trying to also evolve the names to more closely reflect okay. Okay. the capacity. So, so it is an iteration of improvement. It's a progression. Yeah, it is. Okay. And, okay. and the community continues to do that. I tend to stick with the names in the HBR article because most leaders reference HBR okay. as a credible source. Okay. Individualist is the next level, about 10%. Okay. Five to 10, depending on who you talk now, to. Now, what's that mean then at that maturity level? So that's the first level where I start to become hugely introspective. My own inner sense of guidance of right and wrong. So so think the early one, black and white. Yeah. There is a right and there's a wrong. Right. And there's no gray. No gray. Because there's no, not enough reflection. Correct. That's That's exactly the point. If you have limited introspection, then whatever the community that governs your thinking, mm -hmm. whether it's your company or your church or your school or your family, mm -hmm. those tell you right and wrong. At the individualist level and why it's so difficult is when you start to now bring that in to develop your own inner compass, yes. you have to sort out this, yeah. the individual from the other things. Yeah, like my parents might be wrong. Or, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Some of us thought that right. early, <laughs> right. earlier, earlier. But whoever it is, my my church or my boss or my company or my spouse. Right. Now I start sifting through those things, yes. and it is hugely disruptive when I start deciding what's in and what's out. God, that's just brilliant. And it's because of that individualized ten percent streak. Mm -hmm. That they do that. But this is where art, this is where it becomes artful. Innovation comes online at this level. Exactly. Because it can't at the other 85%. Right. So at yeah. that level, a few things happen. They are innovative and also disruptive. Yeah. So at the black and white level, when I tell someone, I, I am more likely to tell people what to do. Because you have to, because that's, that, that's how they communicate. That, yeah, that's a preference. At the innovate or at the individualist level, yeah. If you tell me what to do, I am likely to not do it the way you told me. Find it entertaining to disrupt. <laughs> God, I did that for like 30 years. I think I may have been in that 10%. That, that's why you were self-employed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> You're right. right? So, so right. The, 
So mm. one of the challenge for organizations is how do we create the space for leaders to innovate and be truly brilliant in how they work and not disable the people they are leading. Yes. Because when, when an, someone who's at an expert level comes to you and says, Brad, hey, how do I do this? And you say, I don't care. You go right. figure it out. What they hear is Brad does not know what he's doing, doing and he should not have that Brad. job. Right. Yeah. Right. Or he's withholding. Right. But either worse, way, Brad's yeah. an worse. idiot. Right. So I can't work for that guy. Right, right. So part of the challenge <laughs> part of the challenge is how do we help build that ladder as a cohesive organization? Yeah. So there's not there there are a lot of jobs that require or are more effective with black and white thinking. Absolutely. There are jobs that require innovation. So both are important. Yes. And healthy companies thread that needle effectively without the individualists over disrupting mm -hmm. or the experts over controlling. That's it, right? Yeah. That that that's what bore American entrepreneurialism. Mm -hmm. That balance. Mm -hmm. When you have those two things in balance. Yeah. But you have to have them. You right? have to have both. So right. So when when our more mature folks say, I just don't want to deal with that, well, that, that doesn't, doesn't work. work. It doesn't work. And right. I've seen a lot of organizations where the the top folks are saying, I just want people like me. And they topple over fairly quickly. Right. <laughs> I mean, think about achievers get stuff done. Right. We want people whose whole identity is we drive results. Yeah, exactly. So that's required. We want our experts who are really focused on delivering a quality product, getting it right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, think about you want your surgeon to have some amount of getting it right yeah, yeah. going on. Right. It now, can't just be black and white. <laughs> well, there's some, but but all body parts back in, yeah. black and white. Right. <laughs> all back surgical in, implements. Yeah, out, out. black and white. <laughs> so, I mean, I we want engineers who follow, you know, kind of right. materials. And codes and mechanics, sure. Yeah, we don't want the bridge to collapse because someone right. was being creative with the right. mixing of cement. Right, the ten percent so. <laughs> independent took over the the shop that day. <laughs> so, so you know, joking aside, again, it, they are all required. Now, what's interesting is there is this idea of transcendent include. So, while I may be more mature, okay. I also recognize not only in the organization but in myself mm. the importance of. Some things have to be done to to recipe. Oh, yeah. That hence the word include, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. This is what yeah. I do, but it's not all I need, and it's not all I am. So when oh. I'm working on it, you checking microphones when we got here, yeah, you were very meticulous. Yep. In, <laughs> I am, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> I am, and yet you are also innovative. Yeah. There are some things that just are foundational and have to be done. Quote right, like the mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are innovative things like the shoes. Right, right, right. Both of them can live in the same human being. Uh -huh. And those more innovative leaders can can relate well. Okay. But they often don't with, without some guidance. Okay. The next level is called strategist. It's between one and a half to 4% of leaders. Yeah, I was going to say, where's the next 5%? So that's the one that you would call Collins level five leadership. Okay. Or varying. It it's, doesn't map exactly to Collins, but okay. conceptually. It does. It is the leader who has a long-term time horizon where 20 years, where the individualist is starting to grapple with who am I and what do I stand for? What's the relevancy here and the, what's the point? The strategist is dead on. Like, I know what I stand for. These are the people who are very mission focused, vision focused. Which I love it. I know this is what I'm in business for. I'm curing cancer, or I'm. And I'm not doing this, this, and this. I, I, this is what I'm about. Yeah. Those are the ones you love to work with because you can have, you can create a very clear brand when you know what they're doing, and when and they, they know they what they're doing, and they believe it. And then they can look at the persona of what does it look like to cure cancer. What does it look like to create a sewer system that drains the water so that the flood yesterday okay, now didn't hold on a kill second. people? Now, hold on a second. I want the listeners to hear this. So you're telling me, you just said an important phrase. They can create a persona, right? Those one to four and a half percent, mm -hmm. the strategist. Mm -hmm. He can create a persona of what the impact of his innovation is going to do. The act of productizing something with the right leader 
becomes a brand that is amplified because that product, right, is aligned with that strategic leader who can deliver it and believes it and, and, and already I'm, empathizes with the impact that the consumer or the customer is going to feel. I was going to say, it's aligned with the user experience. Exactly. So when I'm training leaders, I understand that I deliver differently to technology leaders than oncologists. Right. They, they have a different customer Way. and they're measured differently. So how they lead has to look different. Yes. And yet leadership maturity is the same thing. So one of the pieces of our model looks at who am I inside? Okay. So what do I value? Okay. What, how, how do I behave? Yes. What's our culture and what are our systems and processes? And so even though we might be at the strategy level, let's just say with two, let's say that you have an organization and they have this, uh, this other all nearly 5% of the strategy level, one's in healthcare and one's in financial. And let's, let's add even a different um, arena. Let's say a military flag officer. Okay, great. So you've got an, a general or an admiral. Right. You've got- My banker. My you've got your banker. I got my institutional banker and I have healthcare. Mm-hmm. So you're saying because uh, because the products are different and the persona is different, then you guys have a way of nuancing that leadership profile that needs to be different because the audience and productization is different. Leading a group of sailors in is, in the navy is different than is, doctors. Is different than doctors at Ohio State University. Right, right. They require something different. Their and customer is different. Their, wow. their entire work setting is different. So let me ask you this. I know you're not even through your 100%. Are we at the 100% yet? We have the strategists. Is there something on the top? Tell me about the cherry Okay, the so, so actually there, there is now research to look at the several levels on the top. So strategist is the last level we think works well in a corporate or business setting. By that, you mean the bottom level of the top? Bot- bottom level of the top. Is right? Is that what you're so, saying? Or, or it's, well, just think of that as the pyramid. And then we walk into people who build um, constructs. Oh, okay. So think the Dalai Lama, maybe. Okay. Dalai Lama is not worried about delivering quarterly profits. So, okay. so if there's a pyramid, let's say there are nine levels. Thank you. Let's say strategist is level five okay. or six. Okay. There are multiple levels above that. Okay. Very, very few. Well, that's why you only have a percent or so left. Yeah. Okay. So less than 1% is this level called construct aware. So at that level, I start to realize how much of our world is, I want to say made up. Okay. So, so there were- there Constructed, were, hence construct. Yeah. yeah. Right? And, fabricated. And, well, so think of states are fabricated. Yep, they are. I walk across the street and it's a different state. Zip codes, mailing, it's all fabrication. Yeah. It, and it's fabricated for a reason. Yeah, it right? organizes world. our world yeah. so we can get shit done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Getting shit done as well. Well, and so we can make sense of things. Yes, yes. Because otherwise, think how confused you and I would be. We're all, We're it's already. already a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so the leader who is construct aware yes. recognizes that these are constructs and they can recalibrate. So this is what Amazon did. Probably, yeah. Well, and, and so one that we have documented is Nelson Mandela. Well, that's a little bigger than Amazon. Yeah. Okay. I like <laughs> well, that better. Or not bigger, but we... Well, yeah, you're right. You're right. Who knows now? <laughs> um, but we know that Nelson Mandela was able to re... No, that's beautiful. You're right. That's a, that's a beautiful example. I just went straight to banding and, I mean, branding and business mm-hmm. with a new construct because um, that was game changing. But you're, that the Nelson Mandela example is way more richer, certainly. It's deeper. So the construct aware leader is really... And and he he is probably higher than that, but let's end at construct aware and say that okay. and okay. more. They are able to understand the the made up nature of the constructs and help people navigate that path. Because it doesn't help if I say I know what it is, but I'm not gonna tell you. Or just go out and say, Hey, this is all made up shit. Right. Um, you guys stop doing this. Right. Not helpful. Not so, so, so if isn't that I, called Russia <laughs> living in Russia? <laughs> oh, yeah. So kind if of. I can navigate the constructs and lead the transformation, so the people following the that construct aware leader probably won't understand that their construct has just been recalibrated. Right. They just follow. They, so they follow the leader. 
and in a positive way. In, in a positive way. Right. And the leader is one of the examples I use is Frank Lloyd Wright. Most people can't design a Frank Lloyd Wright house, but no, lots but of people can take the blueprints. Exactly. We can mimic it because we want to. And I don't need to understand all of the design principles, no. but I can love living in that house. Yeah, exactly. And think it's super cool. Yeah, yeah. Similarly, the construct aware leader can create the new construct, hand the blueprints off to somebody or implement the change and go off and do the next thing because those people aren't going to run your companies. Got it. Generally. And does that touch a little bit that they know to hand that off, that sense of self-awareness? Oh, the, this is a hugely self-aware level. Okay. Because they, if A, they can see the construct, so they're self-aware. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they're beyond reflection and strategy. Right. Right? So they're self-actualized in that sense. Yeah, to use the Maslow term, they yeah. would be... Well, because what's happening in, um, within and outside, so they're seeing all the constructs of cities and states and zip codes. Mm -hmm. They're also seeing all of the constructs inside of themselves. So right. their self-identity has also melted. Right. And they have reconstructed a way to make sense of the world. That is just brilliant. And that's why this never happens. It yeah. doesn't happen much. doesn't happen much. Right. And but the point is we strive for that. And if we can reach a percentage goal of that, as just say a CEO or American business leader or a leadership organization, it's a huge transformation for a company. Think about what it would be like if Nelson Mandela were running some of our companies. And we'd have to get rid of quarterly profits, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want him to run Swiss Miss Coco. I just like the idea of Nelson Mandela and Coco. Well, and but, the problem is the training plan of 25 years in jail, most people opt out of yeah, that Yeah, exactly. One, so. But <laughs> could you imagine that? Schooling, <laughs> free the world, and go to prison. <laughs> and then come out and, and then change out the world. And, right, right. Or Run change the Procter and Gamble. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an unbelievable thought. So what we're trying to do is, is shorten the process from okay. 25 years in prison sure. to... But it's not... You don't go to a weekend workshop and turn into Nelson Mandela. No, I, I understand. So, so what is that process? And are people willing to go through the inner struggles? Mm -hmm. And they are struggles. This oh, is I, not a... I mean, you know what you've been through. Yep. Yes. Okay. So when you said that they realize that they're at the top and they can construct and configure a positive pathway for those who want to follow. Mm -hmm. And then they know someone else needs to manage it. And then you said, quote, they're off to the next thing because that's what they should do. That's what they should do. Because they understand con constructs yeah. and they don't have this benefits mm -hmm. people, community, organization. So they should move to the next thing. There's also an ethical thing that happens at this level. Okay. That they are, and, and I'll use again Nelson Mandela, committed to the greater good yeah. of the world. Yeah. So why would they stay at Procter and Gamble's a great company? Just to make money. Who why cares? would they right. they're they're of the people I know at this level and there are many less than 1% of 7 billion people is still a bunch. Right. So <laughs> there are a bunch of these people uh -huh. and I don't know any of them that are motivated significantly by money. They're also not homeless. Right? I understand. <laughs> I understand. So it's now, easy to be worked, Have you worked with uh, someone of this caliber that you would consider you, you have. What is, may I ask some questions about this? Mm -hmm. What do you think their secret weapon is? Is it as easy as empathy and, and, and intellect? Is it um, the ability to map, package, and move on? Is it this wide conscientiousness? It's that, all of those. Oh, it is. It's all of, of course. So, so if we think about cognitive complexity, they're the most complex people you know. But, but think about the, some of the things Einstein said, like they're able to make it simple. Yeah, so, so which is have, complex, right? You have to get it so you can simplify it. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> Woo! That was like jazz in my brain right there. That you're right. That's exactly it. Okay. So... so they, they are incredibly nuanced in their thinking and they know when to pull out nuance. So let me use an example. Okay. Um, I care a great deal about the environment. I ran a, a nature preserve for a while and I need to go shopping and buy toilet paper. Okay. Do I have to consider the 
was it sustainably harvested? Mm -hmm. Was it bleached? Mm -hmm. How is it, is it sold in a mom and pop shop in my neighborhood? Right. Is it also not rough? Because I- I care about the functionality. Yeah. Yeah. So do I have to go through that thought process every time I buy toilet paper cleaning supplies? Mm -hmm. At some point, I collapse. Right. So, so there, <laughs> I'd never get out of the darn grocery store. Right. And that's if I shop at a small co-op. Right. So, so there is a balance between all of that nuance. Okay. And navigating life. Right. Finding my keys and getting in the car. Right, right. So, it's the, the cognitive complexity, the emotional piece, the ability to empathize and relate to a broad range of people. Right. So, that is a huge, that is a huge attribute. It is a huge attribute and I can't be so empathetic that again, I... Right. Give everything away and I don't stay on objective. And I don't stay on objective. I'm so overwhelmed by the bad stuff happening in the world. I can't move. Yeah. So, Send me Hello Fresh boxes. I'll see you in six months. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Coney's got boxes against his door. We can't get him out. <laughs> and he's, he's in there doing something he's and we're in, not he's sure what he's doing. He's scribbling. <laughs> well, that's, this is just fascinating. So behaviorally yeah one of the things you won't see in this magician construct aware person is they they seem so quote normal mm. so the strategist often looks like a ceo running a sure, complex sure, company sure. um and they are more balanced often than people at some of the earlier levels sure so because each- they have that discipline of strategy all the time to come back to the loop come back to the loop and if in the loop is I value my family, right, as well as oh, then they find cancer. then they find then they find balance. And, and so, if you look at someone like a Colin Powell, probably mm-hmm. tests at at the strategist level. Okay. So at this more nuanced level, it is all of those things you said. The thing that is so interesting is you won't pick them out in a crowd because they don't look special. Right. They don't wear a t-shirt that I says, I'm a one for hats. <laughs> I'm waiting for hats. <laughs> they don't have them in your size. That's they the do have them in oh, my okay, size. Okay. I was going to say your CC capacity, you probably wear like, I wear a seven and a half. You probably wear like a 29. Well, it's probably like one of those overblown foam hats. Well, the problem is nobody recognizes them because they're secret hats. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. They're probably invisible in secret hats. That's right. That's great. So, we and uh, up to a certain level, you can pretty much tell who's more complex and who's less yeah, complex. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, at the latest stages, it's often how they make you feel. Oh, so it's what they give back. It's what they leave behind. It's the impact of their presence. Of their presence. So, so an achiever, huh. rush, 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 busy, yeah. getting results all the time, getting results. Yeah. That's the mantra. At the later stages, there is a, great deal of empathy and they still care about getting results but there is this sense of i am going to do what is required in this moment mm. to deliver the best outcome for the most people right which in one moment it's having a podcast in another moment it may be recharging in my garden right right that's amazing but let me ask you this how often do you professionally consult companies where most of the leadership team don't care about size right now. Most of the leadership team is strategy or above. Never. 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 How long have you been doing this? Using these models yep. over 20 years. Okay. So. So why is my, que- it's my question that's wrong then. No, it's not. It, oh, it, it isn't. It's one to 4%. Okay, so that's why. So, and they don't all need to be. Like, that's why I say my question is wrong. Because you're saying that we need these other ecosystems of leadership to get stuff done. Yeah. And what we need is, if you've got a strategist in the room, pay attention to them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's why this model is so important. Because if you don't know what good looks like, yeah, and you think that other guy is good, then you're you, not following the strategist in the room. Well, okay, so now you're, you've now brought this entirely back to brand. So let's just say, let, let, let's make this a brand for a second instead of mm-hmm. a leader. Okay. And the brand is empathetic. Mm-hmm. The brand is curious but balanced. 
uh, complexity of intellectualism. But the brand over time is not agile. It can't take in new information and it can't change things. And it doesn't have the proper marketing campaigns or support. So I've now made your leader a brand. Okay. I would argue that that brand that's not listening to strategy, that brand that doesn't have the black and white blocking and tackling of marketing, no matter how high they are at that 1%, the organization brings the brand down. Unless that leader, the reason they're at that half percent, can align all of these development stages, your maturity stages, so that the brand can stay afloat and remain, you use the word in leadership, sustainable. I use the word in brand, relevant. So one of the things that comes online at that strategist level is the ability to recognize each of the stages. Mm-hmm. Now, they may not have the terminology. Not Sure, they don't that, need to. But they can, it can look at someone who's an expert whose focus is on quality and exceptional delivery. Sure. And we want people in the quality department who are good at that. We want people, technology um, database managers and coders. Right. We want people achieving results. That strategist level, think of a symphony conductor. Okay. You can't have all flutes. Right. right even right. if you like flutes. Right. Even if you're obsessed with the flute. <laughs> Jethro Tull had a flute. Right. They didn't have all flutes. Thank you. I was waiting for the music component of this. We're in. Thank you. So one flute probably okay. for Jethro yeah, Tull. Yeah, just one. It's probably wooden. It's probably hand carved, but yes. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, and when you listen to Yo-Yo Ma, you hear oh, clearly a great piano. But there are also... An accompaniment, yes. So any great leader, unless they're a solopreneur, and right. solopreneurs don't often get to make the impact that a Procter & Gamble does. Okay. So, because they don't have the resources, bandwidth, or collaborative innovation to get there mm-hmm. fast enough, especially mm-hmm. in the world today, that changes every five minutes. Yeah. Right? So, so not to diss on solopreneurs. Yeah, yeah, Bill. But- um, and the other thing that's interesting, though, is often these construct-aware people mm-hmm. are working in consulting roles. Absolutely. So they are your solopreneurs. Yes. So, so they're, But they're at the top. They're at the top. Yeah. And they're working with the top. Right. So they're working, we would hope, with the... We keep saying P&G. But, so we assume the P&Gs right. and the Whirlpools. Persona and the, music, whatever. Ma- major yeah. brands. Yeah. Leaders like that, that you have worked with, mm-hmm. right? Then in that role, we would say that those, I would say from a brand standpoint, they understand the company, they understand the brand, and they understand humbly, because we had this empathy, right? Yeah. That they stand, they're behind the brand. The brand is what the customer makes. And even though they might be in that top 1%, Maureen, they are still humble enough to know they serve the brand and they ask their followers in the company to come along with them in serving the brand. You would agree that that would be a brandist and a mature, to use your language, a mature leader. So I'm, I want to give you a specific language because you okay. hit on some of the things that I think are absolutely oh. foundational and okay. humility is the start. Now, these are the qualities of? Strategist. Beautiful. Okay, you give them to us. So, professionally humble, care more about getting it right than being right. So, I'm focused on the mission. I'm curing cancer. I'm delivering great music. Right. I, if I am the conductor, I want to deliver an exceptional experience right, for- Right, you never forget. Yeah. So that's the humility. Okay. Well, actually, you know what? Let's use Dr. Fauci as an example. Okay. Because we're seeing that he has had to go back several times and say, my prior position, it changed. Yeah. And so I talk about the leader, the, the leader in this era has to be more the mind of a scientist than I, than I contrast it with Gibbs on NCIS. Okay. Gibbs had all the answers, right? Right, right, right. Um, smart people working around him, but right. he, he was in charge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if you look at... And, and That's great. For visualizations, I look at someone like Einstein, which yeah. is my, one of my favorite historic uh, characters. Yeah. I have a high... So, so stuff's happening. Mm-hmm. I can't 
get the quote right answer mm-hmm. long term because mm-hmm. I don't have enough information, mm-hmm. but I have to do something. Mm-hmm. So I make the smallest next right decision. So I have a hypothesis. We have to do something. We we take a, a stance. We issue a policy. The best next right decision. Yes. <sighs> and I have the humility to that. say. Think about that in business. I might have been wrong and now I have new information. So now I've got to make the next best right decision. And in this era, so that's why <laughs> this level of leadership is so foundational now. We didn't know when COVID, it was supposed right. to be two weeks. I know. And then it was a month. Then, right. then it was a year right, and a half. Right. So, so the leader is making the next best right decision and owning, we followed the science, we followed our customers, we followed our brand promise. Okay. And now I'm making the next best right decision. Because I need this nuance now because this has changed. Because something else has changed. Right. We've got the Delta variant. So we thought no masks. Now right. we're seeing mask mandates right. again. Right, right, right. It is the next right decision. So that's one. Okay. And then what's the next? This is still strategist characteristics. So there are seven of them. Second is unwavering commitment to right action. Okay. So again, Dr. Fauci, and I assume he is committed to saving lives. Right. And the next best right action is what is that next best step? Sure. 360 degree thinker. I understand long and short term implications. So I'm looking at the health of the population. I'm looking at the economy. Right. I'm looking at a lockdown is going to impact mental health, right. economics, suicide rates, drug overdoses. Looking at everything. Everything. Right. A- and most people don't have the systemic understanding to look at long-term, short-term. Right, right. Oh, and, and the, the ripples. And dimensionalizing ripples. Dimensionalizing a problem mm-hmm. and seeing where it can go and where we can stem it away from a problem that we can't solve down the road. But if we do it now, we can. So who are my customers? Okay. Who are my customers' customers? customers. Who are their customers? Right. I am thinking systemically yeah. through. Love it. And if we if we delay um, access to certain resources, right. people will die right. because they're not going to get their cancer treatment. Right, whatever. But, so, I mean, these are really complex decisions right. and yet doing nothing isn't an option. That's right. And, and this is where the emotional piece comes in. How do I, as that guy, n- know that whatever decision I make, people mm-hmm. are going to die? Yeah. I mean, most of us aren't making decisions no, that no. have lives. And I am very happy nobody l- dies right, right. from my leadership right, advice. Right. Um, understand, the more I can understand the nuance of the system. And the more I have a team of people. Okay, what's the next attribute? Intellectually versatile. So I understand beyond my own field. So I'm thinking about what's happening in Russia, what's happening in China. I'm thinking about how we are finding a vaccine that leverages the best science of everyone. Right. Um, I'm leveraging my hobby of um, African drumming right. and thinking about how people come together in circles right. and how they disband. Right. All of that comes into my thinking Thought process, process to solve the problem. Next is highly authentic and reflective. So externally, I'm authentic. Internally, that's that ongoing evaluation. Given what's happening now, what are my values? Yeah. Are they the same as they used yeah, to be? Yeah, did they change? Did, or is the order different? Yeah. Was I shaped during a point in time where we yeah. didn't have a pandemic? Yeah, yeah. And... Because my values drive my behavior, yeah. if I look at my behavior and say, is that something I would be proud of as my legacy? If so not, that, I can't do it. Or wh- how do I reshape it? Because again, doing yeah. nothing. Not an yeah. Option. And I don't want to rationalize something that I don't believe in. So I need to mm-hmm. reshape it. And that's a great word you just used. So, so the reflection for someone at this level, mm-hmm. the things I do matter mm-hmm. and they matter to a large number of people often. Yes. So how do I stay um, positive in my thinking and positive in my impact? Because it's easy in those kind of roles to get overwhelmed. Yeah. Right. So I also have have to have personal systems that enable me to not collapse. Yeah. And and live through this. Mm -hmm. Um, What's the sixth one? Able to inspire followership. Okay. If nobody follows me, I'm not leading. Right. I'm right. controlling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this ability to connect with people, create a shared vision, inspire them to do the right thing, right. to inspire them to follow the brand. Right. 
the brand has to inspire them. Yes, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then the last one is innately collaborative. And again, nuanced. See, we just had Donna McGavaro, who is a singer-songwriter. And one of the things that I asked her on the podcast, unbelievable singer-songwriter, asked her on the podcast, wasn't it hard all those years without collaborating? Didn't you ever hand your guitar to somebody and say, can you finish this? And so I guess it's just how we view, you know, when we need collaboration, when we don't. But I think that collaboration, yeah, is essential. Not as a lean-on tool, but as a check. The the challenges we are facing are too complex for one one person person. to do. And by collaboration, I don't mean everyone has to agree to everything. No, and it's not opinion consensus building. No. (laughs) Hell no, No. you're saying. You're saying (laughs) hell no to that. No, that's one of Dante's rings for me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right, so now let's flip it. Mm -hmm. So now we've talked about what a great, top leader looks like. Mm-hmm. And your insight is unbelievable. Now let's look. And, and there was a point that I sent to you in, in um, anticipation of this conversation mm-hmm. is this idea that if you're not a brandist leading, leading the brand properly, then you're a bandit inside. Mm-hmm. But one of the points that I made here that I'd like you to speak to is that ultimately bandit leadership steals the brand's equity, whether that's on purpose or not. Right. And by that, I mean, by equity, I mean, the position of the brand in the marketplace, its products, the people, how the philosophy is the brand the, the brand was built on. So let me speak a little bit to the idea of diminishing the brand value. Okay. I get that again, everything's a, a balancing act. Mm-hmm. A- and there is a tension to manage between the financial delivery, the brand, the customer expectation, the next product launch, right? The yeah. community even. Yeah, so there's a tension and sometimes the brand gives its position, gives its resources to IT when something crashes. You're absolutely right. That, that can absolutely happen. And, Great point. And that's not the same thing you're talking about. So I want to make no. sure people are are understanding that you're not saying that the brand is, is the only thing. No, it's no, no. part of the constellation. Or, it's the part of the organism called the company. A, and organic. And organic. Organism is I, is the metaphor I love. That mm-hmm. the brand suffers at some point. The value of the overall enterprise is diminished. D- diminished, and that's the the. So, as a good leadership team, I yes. have to continue to pay attention to all of those competing factors, and ensure that brand gets the attention. It is absolutely one of the financial assets that the company's built. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we were talking the other day. If you took how much uh, companies spend on products and then don't, then turn around and say to you, well, we can't spend that kind of money on the brand. <laughs> or they'll say, we're a professional service firm. We don't have to invest in people. We are people, Right. But the, yeah, and people depreciate just exactly, like resources do. Exactly. And so that is the balancing act. Products, innovation, great leaders, people, and the brand. And the brand depreciates just like your people do. That's just perfectly said. If you don't energize it. Yeah. And, and that energy comes from, hence why I wanted you on the podcast, an innovative leader. One of those one percenters mm-hmm. or at least a strategist. Yeah. That knows it's got to be agitated, energized, rearticulated, iterated again and again and again. I'm not saying to make the brand a moving target. We want that old uh, Harley Davidson logo to look the way it does. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying to get rid of legacies, but you can still keep it relevant by having an innovative leader. Yeah, we're, we're living in Columbus, Ohio, home of Wendy's. And the Wendy's uniform, I worked at Wendy's when I was in college. And we had little scarfs and things. Yeah. Wendy's has now just rebranded all of their stores. I know. I think they look great. They do. And I want to go in that place Ex- because the brand is attractive. Yes. Isn't that amazing? A- and, and that's because they invested in the brand. They didn't mm-hmm. change the hamburger recipe. Matter of fact, the new brand says, quality is our recipe. Big, bold, beautiful letters. How simple is that? And it's knowing when to update the brand. Right. 
and when not. So this is for people who are hearing, we have to change the brand every year. That is not true. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, we can't do that. <laughs> you, you helped me through a rebranding and I know it's not happening next year. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's knowing when to, when the old brand is tired or just not delivering the, this, this is an ROI issue for our financial people. Yeah. This, my branch has economic value. Yes. And when it stops having economic value, when it, when it diminishes, I need to refresh. Yes. Yes. Perfectly said. Give me the one reason why an innovative leader one day is no longer that strategist, no longer that one percenter. And he becomes a bandit or she without knowing it. Does this happen? So the the actual levels of maturity are in our our meaning making. Okay. So my inner algorithm, my thought process, my way of making sense of the world. And that's matures. why you use the phrase meaning making. Right. So something happens and I make, I attribute a meaning to it. Right. So... So it is unlikely that my strategist will stop being a strategist, but they may be in a situation that punish. And so this is the matching of culture and systems to, to humans. Okay. They may be in a setting that does not allow them to live their strategist potential. Okay. So I could get be it punished for, for being a strategist. Sure. I've, I've seen that. I know exactly what yep. you're saying. Yep. And nothing happens. I mean, if that's going to be the case, then the company's blind. The company's blind. The, the strategist leader often disrupts right. and then they exit. So they sure. disrupt to try to make the change that right. they know needs to happen. Which is the right thing to do. That's the humble right thing to do. And yet, But they're up against the wall, right? They have to. So this is why board development is so important. Boards, if they hire these advanced CEOs and then the board steps on their heads, Mm -hmm. not helpful. It, no. and, and this is where, again, they're not getting the ROI for the investment they've made. If you are a board and you bring in the most progressive leader, you got to be prepared to support them. And when it gets uncomfortable, navigate those situations because it, it's always uncomfortable it's right. over something. Right, right. Wonderful conversation, as I expected. This idea of equity and innovative leaders and these developmental stages of maturity, um, I think are huge triggers and agents about the value of brand. So thank you for your time. Again, wonderful, wonderful insights. Brad, it is always a pleasure. And I will come back just to hang out with you. Okay. And we have to talk about your band here, the Indigo Girls. Okay. The next time, we're going to use this as a tease. The next time you come back, we're going over the, we're starting off leadership as compared to the Indigo Girls brand. Okay.